Tonight, live from the Inspire Theater on the corner of Las Vegas Boulevard and Fremont Street in the heart of fabulous downtown Las Vegas, we present the Downtown Podcast. Starring your host, Dylan Jorgensen. Your co-host, Bonnie Gore. Music by yours truly, DJ Lenny Love Alfonso. Tonight's guest, author of Wild Cards, Phil Reed. CEO of Roadmap Inc., Ruth Hedges. Music by Joshua Greenway. And now, ladies and gentlemen, let's give it up for the man who wants to make the downtown podcast great again, Mr. Dylan Jorgensen. Yeah! yeah. Ah, yes! <laughs> oh, that worked much better. Great audience, great audience. Thank you guys so much for coming out. This is episode 167 of the Downtown Podcast. Thank you for coming. The, the goal of this show is to be a window into and out of Las Vegas. That means we show the world the great entrepreneurs we have downtown, and the world shows us great new ideas. And that's exactly what's going to happen in a few minutes. But first off, let's start by giving a huge round of applause for the cast and crew, because it takes a lot of work to put this show together every week. Thank you, guys. Um, so now, if the cast and crew wants to join me up on the stage, we're going to start the show with our traditional football-style huddle. So, audience, are you ready? Yeah. Uh, you do better than that. Audience, are you ready? Yeah. All right, we got this. Who's got number one talk show in Vegas? We do. Who's going to leave it all there on the set tonight? We do. Who's going to have a lot of fun doing it? We do. Probably using the Philippines up three. One, two, three. We're probably using the Philippines. Yeah. Get ready for a great show, everyone. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome to another great episode of Downtown Podcast. Now, show of hands, how many people here gamble? All right, yeah, we have a lot of locals, but locals still like to gamble, right? How many of you like to play the game Blackjack? Yeah, it's, it's pretty fun. Count to 21. Pretty simple, right? <laughs> Well, to win at Blackjack, it takes a little bit more than that. Now, our next guest is an author of a book that explains a few oddities about the game Blackjack. Let's find out what a priest, a $30,000 bankroll, and counting cards has in common. Let's welcome Philip Reed. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Good to yeah. Great to have you. Now, you have a lot of information to tell me. I started reading your book. And I haven't gotten to the end, but I do want to hear all about how you got into card counting. Are you a compulsive gambler? Are you yeah. a, okay. a gamble? Um, do you have an addiction? Now am I a compulsive gambler or before I wrote the book? Before. What, Kate, what did you do before you wrote this book? Were you gambling and you decided to write this book? Like, okay. A little bit of background. And yeah. The book is Wild Cards, by the way. Yeah, so um, I came from a very uh, religious family. Okay. And um, I shouldn't really say this, but my mother died about five years ago. Oh, coincidentally, sorry. Coincidentally, that's when I started writing this book. Oh, you know? yeah. Go, you're so, but then on the other side of my family, my father's a mathematician. He's a, uh, he worked for MIT. And that is very so, beneficial in gambling. You know, absolutely. So you're intrigued by it. I was. Um, before I did this, I was involved in horse racing. I also, I'm very competitive. I like to play sports. So okay. I kind of see blackjack as a, as a sport, almost. And I've always been fascinated by performance under pressure. Right. You know, because that's where it really counts. I mean, I can play blackjack on my kitchen table and keep the count perfectly, but if you have $100 in front of you, it's a lot more pressure. <laughs> that's a lot more pressure. Now, let's start at the beginning. You met a uh, card counter gambler named Bill, yeah. correct? And he goes by several aliases. Right. And he counts cards. He makes money doing this for a living. Right. And you decided, I'm going to take some time out of my life. I'm going to follow this guy around and see what this is about. I was looking for a, a topic for a book. I, I write fiction also. OK. And I had a character in the book that I wanted to be a card counter. So then I met a real card counter, and I thought, I'll do some research. And then some I wound research. up actually writing a book. Yeah. Right. But the big turning point was, uh, it's like, I'm going to follow you around. I'm going to watch you play. And he said, no, I'm going to teach you to play. And then you're going to find out what it's like. And it's, I'm terrible at math. You know, I've never been good at this kind of thing. I'm not sure I can do it. And he said, well, that's why you should do it. Well, let's talk about the stigma for, about card counting. You know, being in Vegas, it's 
uh, you know, it's a little known fact that card counters will get kicked out. It almost sounds illegal, but it's not actually illegal, right? No, it's not illegal. And uh, back in the 90s, sometimes not only were they kicked out, but they would be taken into the back room and they'd break their jaw. Right. You know, back when were, the mob was running the yeah, town. Yeah, yeah. They called that getting uh, back roomed. Now right. you get backed off. Meaning backed that, off now. Yeah. So no. Okay, and that's just like 86 from the casino. Yeah. But you won't get arrested. Will you go to jail for card counting? Okay, so the way that it works is the first time they'll back you off and just say you have to leave, you can't play, or whatever. And then the second time they read you the Trespass Act, and then if you're in there again, they'll put you in jail. So you decide to card count, you follow this guy around. Yeah. Give me a little smidgen of what a day in the life of that is like. Well, we would take trips maybe once a month. Okay. And we came here quite a lot, of course. I live in Southern California. But we also went to Tunica in okay. Mississippi, uh, Atlantic City, uh, and you know all of the big centers. And then in the middle of that, I took a sabbatical from my job and I went to Argentina, and I played there too. By yourself, or were you still by, following By him? myself. So yeah. was that scarier when you were just kind of off on your own and in a foreign country? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there I was playing and speaking Spanish. So I'm trying to learn the count and speak Spanish and communicate with the people around me. Oh, wow. So, what an yeah, adventure. It was a lot of pressure. So why did you do it? Did you just, you know, I want to make some extra money. I know you wanted to kind of follow somebody, shadow somebody for the next character in your book, but was there a little motive behind it besides making some extra cash? Did well, you make extra cash? I guess that's what I should ask. Did you actually make money doing this? I did. In the first year, um, I cleared $6,000. Wow. So, I mean, yeah. it's, <laughs> thank you. Because it takes... It takes money to make money in this uh, oh, yeah. whole scheme, too, because you have to put a lot out to get some back, right? A absolutely. So it's I an mean, investment. Yeah, well, a $30,000 bankroll. Right. Part, so of, that, that's what part of that came from the priest. So tell us, this is one of my favorite parts. <laughs> tell us where the priest okay. you know, comes into play in this whole adventure. So I hear about this card counter, and I think, I don't know whether I want to write a book with this guy or not. I call him up and he said, well, me and the priest from my diocese, you know, we go off and he plays video poker and he invests money in me and we play and then we give part of it to the church. And I thought, this is not your ordinary guy. Right. <laughs> you know, I, I've got to do this. So the three of us very often would, would, would go. And, um, you know, the people love the priest. Like people who have read the book, they say, you know, that, that's my favorite character. You should have made him a bigger character. And it's like, well, he was a busy guy. Right. You know, he was burying people, baptizing people. Marrying you know. people. I'm yeah. Sure all so for him to come to Vegas and play video poker for a couple of days was his way of just sort of blowing off steam. And playing with him, would you ask him to pray for you guys to win? Okay. So when we <laughs> I mean, were... it couldn't it hurt, right? Well, okay. So the guy that I play with, Bill, I mean, he's a very high stakes player. So he'll go down like two or $3,000 in maybe 20 minutes, you know, and then he'll fight his way back, you know. So... Me and the priest are watching, and the priest is like this. It's like, well, God, I can't take this anymore. You know, this right, is too much. Right. So we got done, and I said, well, were you praying for Bill? And he kind of looked at me, and he said, it doesn't work that oh. way. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I think he's a great character in the book as well, and he's very entertaining. I think it's fun that he donated the money that he won back to the diocese. Did you do anything special with the money you won? Did you just go on a nice Caribbean vacation, which there's nothing wrong with? Yeah, well, once you, when, you, when you win money gambling, it's a big temptation to say, I'm going to buy that thing I always want. Okay. You know, like I really wanted to get a nice road bike right. for riding around. But uh, instead, I gave it to an after school program. Oh, uh, I, well, I gave, very nice. Yeah. My, uh, the, the church that I go to, they tutor kids. They, okay. they tutor kids. And I thought, I don't want to be just some guy, you know, getting money and then blowing it or on drinks or whatever. So right. I gave 10% of it to them. Now, when it comes to counting cards, how do you get to the point where it's, I feel like everybody kind of has to count to a certain extent. I've played blackjack. I'm not very good at it. But, you know, you have to count to 21 or, you know, see if you're going to bust. Or you, you know, you kind of look at the guy next to you and say, well, you know, it looks like he's going to bust, so I'll hit. Right. What? What's considered card counting? Where do they start to cut you off? Where do you take it to the next level? I mean, and, yep. and decide the arithmetic becomes very important. Right, sure. Well, card counting is a little bit of a misnomer. You're not really counting the cards. You're keeping track of the ratio between high cards and low cards. Mm -hmm. So when there's a lot of high cards, the deck is in your favor. It's hot. And so you should have as much money out on the table as you can. And when it's low, you should either back, back away from the table or just keep your bets really low. And so it's just that ratio that you're trying to find. And when casinos start to see you doing this, start to see you uh, making money, yeah. how do they tell if you come in in disguise or if you, you know, if they say, hey, you're backed off, don't come in here again. Right. How do you go back in there again? Or do you just not? Do you take the chance? 
Yeah, um, yeah, I got backed off on one of the strip casinos, and I waited six months, I went back in, and then I gave him my card again, and nothing happened. Nothing. I'm waiting and waiting, you know, like, when, when, is the, when is the tap on the shoulder coming? Because it's one of the best games out there. Right. So, How exciting. Uh, That's an adrenaline rush as well, I can imagine. Yeah, okay, so I, I worked it out with the priest. What's so, gr <laughs> what, what's so great about it, you know? And I said, you know, I think it's all about greed. You know, you look around at the hotels, what built them? It's gambling, mm -hmm. right? He said, no, yeah, no, they no. Yeah, they didn't build that thing by uh, you guys winning everything. Right? <laughs> no. So he said, it's not about greed. He said, it's about risk. Because when you're risking something, you're completely in the now. So it's oh. like that moment when somebody hits a baseball and you don't know if it's going to be a foul ball or a grand slam. Right. And you when you're playing. Give it all you got at that Yeah, moment. I mean, you're completely engaged. That is awesome. Well, why don't we get the audience involved and figure out if any of them are willing to take a risk? And this is to win his book, which I promise you is super exciting and really fun to read. And I think you could learn some tips. Um, Phil's going to ask you guys some questions. And uh, Akil is going to come around and see who's willing to answer. And whoever wins gets the book. Yeah, so the most um, uh, misplayed uh, thing in blackjack is if you have an A7, so that's 18. OK. Right? Uh, and the dealer has a 10, what is the play? Don't hit. Well, kill. The, yeah, a kill. So it, who thinks? So you get a soft eight, a soft eight, soft eight. That's right. And most people figure, I've got an 18, so I'm going to stand. So, right. so you say to hit, right? Hit. You say hit? Yeah. This ain't your first rodeo, is it? No. OK. Are we going to do about raise uh, hands, yeah. or just? Yeah, OK, so the next question, we'll do a raise of hands. Oh, okay. All right, no, it's OK. We're used to shouting things out here, right? So the next question. Let's see who really knows their blackjack. OK, okay. one more question on oh, blackjack. OK, sure. What are, the, what are the two pairs that you always split? And I know you're not going to know this. You can't say so. it. Can't say <laughs> All right, you're the first one hand up. Let's see. Two, two, and what's the other one? Tens. Oh! No? No? No. 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 no? Aces and eights. Yeah. Aces and eights. Why Aces is that? Eights. Well, OK, with aces, you've got two strong hands. With eights, you're trying to make a weak hand better. Oh, OK. So it's always split that. Always. What if you run out of money? You just. <laughs> 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 what happens? Do you borrow it from like the guy next to you if you're really confident? Do people do you, that? You, you know what's kind of funny is you can actually place bets for people. Like if you were standing behind the table, you can bet with the oh. person. That's called yeah. Oh. It's called back bet. you got to take her out to the casino tonight. <laughs> I think he could. Actually, <laughs> through our website, we're going to offer seminars. That's perfect. So. Awesome. And what is your website? Where can people find you? Yeah. Um, Aside so, from the blackjack table. Well, first of all, they have to buy the book. Right. You have to buy the I'm book. I'm not talking <laughs> to anybody that doesn't buy the book. It's a great book, you guys. I, like, it's a, such an easy read. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's a priest in this one, so it's yeah. a little bit different. <laughs> There's a good priest in this yes. one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah good priest. Yeah, uh, Ace Card Counter is the name of my, uh, my website. Card counter Ace dot Card com, dot Counter. Dot com. Yeah, but you can find me, Philip Reed. You know, I have a website uh, for my right. Other yeah, PhilipReed.com as well. Well, thank you so much, Philip. Thank you. I mean, I could talk to you about this for days because you have so many cool stories. But everybody should buy the book and uh, contact Philip because he has some more awesome stories and he can maybe teach you how to count and make some money. I intend to do that. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. That was fun. Hi. Thank you, guys. Well, to follow up that fascinating segment, we have an amazing guest. And she actually helped us write the initial legislation that allowed everyday citizens like you and me to invest in uh, crowdfunded projects for equity. So please put your hands together for Ruth Hedges. Come on out, Ruth. Excuse me. Welcome. What? Yeah, long flight. Thank you for coming back. Hi. Okay. Hi, so, guys. so first off, a great starting point is you just barely got back from Washington D.C. I would love to have you explain why you were out there. Sure. Um, so I was at on Capitol Hill. With, uh, Boo. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. with uh, the dysfunctional congressmen and senators that run this country, um, who actually had a moment of sanity in uh, 2012, 2012 they actually yeah. passed a law to allow all of 230 what's called unaccredited investors 
to be able to invest in, in startup businesses like people did in Facebook and Yahoo and Microsoft and all the great public companies that uh, initially sold for you know, pennies, uh, nickels, and dimes and, and made those people very wealthy. So um, it was the launch of this new bill, which took the SEC three and a half years to write a 685-page uh, book of, of rules to make sure that we could actually figure out how to sell stock to each other. I know, it, it's crazy. So, so why don't you give everybody a rundown, because I wasn't very familiar with it when I first started talking to you, that I didn't even realize, so who could have invested in businesses and who couldn't have before the bill, and then how did that change? So we, have, we had a uh, law on the books, it was 80 years old, and it pre prevented somebody from driving up to a farm and selling some little old lady bogus stock certificate. That was my grandpa's business, yeah. Exactly. It was terrible, right. yeah. <laughs> And uh, during the recession in 2009, a group of us got together and realized that this was ridiculous. That even though the banks stopped lending, the VCs and angels stopped investing, the public actually controlled trillions of dollars. And we could make, you know, just like we could go into a casino or buy lottery tickets or buy $10,000 shoes or a pocketbook or whatever we wanted with our money, we could actually help each other and create jobs. Because 60% of the jobs in this country are actually created by startups, not by Fortune 500. Oh, yeah, that's great. So, <laughs> so, okay, so so one cool thing about this interview, it's different than a lot of them, is at the end, you're going to be giving a free ticket to a conference you're putting on to somebody who remembers a statistic. So yes. I don't know, don't, don't repeat it, don't repeat it, don't share answers, but try to get it. But there's going to be several more statistics. So why don't we jump into that section and tell me a little bit about how the crowdfunding landscape looks. Right, so um, actually crowdfunding started a long time ago. The Statue of Liberty was crowdfunded. Yeah, uh, I didn't they, know that. Yeah, yeah when they came over with the statue, they didn't have any place to put it. So they actually uh, put an ad in the newspaper and they asked people if they wanted to donate to, this, to build this concrete base. And people gave pennies and nickels and they actually crowdfunded a um, hundred and something thousand dollars to build, wow. this, to be able to put the statue over. So that, it's really been around a long time, but obviously with, the, um, with technology, it's, it's a game changer uh, because we can actually do this online. And with social media, we can learn about things very quickly. So, um, so anyway, so we, uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with, you talked about Kickstarter and mm -hmm. Indiegogo. That's called reward-based crowdfunding. So that's when you give people money in exchange for some kind of, um, some kind of some kind of a reward. So if you have a prototype of a product, if you have a, a book, if you have a CD, and if you wanted to, you know, get people to fund you, so you could actually create some inventory. Right, it's a great place you to start. You could start right with prototype. Okay, and now we can give away equity. It wasn't always like that. Right. Um, so we'll talk about a little bit more of these statistics. Like how many dollars, especially now in 2016, is there going into crowdfunding? So in 2012, it was $1.7 billion. And last year was $35 billion. And this, this is, oh, I mean. Yeah, it's it, great, yeah. yeah. And, and this is uh, accumulation of uh, equity, donation, and rewards. You're all familiar with GoFundMe. Uh, they've done yeah. over a billion dollars of cause-related crowdfunding, which is another, in, I mean, game changer, right? right. Kidney transplants, Katrina, um, plane crashes, whatever it is. It, you know, there was uh, the Boston Marathon. I love this story. The Just Boston did. Marathon uh, was on a Sunday. A couple each lost a leg running the Boston yeah. Marathon. It's terrible, yeah. Their friends on Monday morning set up a GoFundMe account, and by Friday they had raised three quarters of a million dollars in wow, five days. Wow, that's amazing! Yeah, that's you know, like, if you think about Jerry Lewis and the telethon and how long it took to right, raise no, and all the coordination to put the show on, world. and you know, they were immediately able. To, to help this family, right. and, and it's really amazing. Okay, so I wanted to, a lot of entrepreneurs out there might be interested in, but I wanted to kind of get a feel for what a good type of business is and what a good type of business isn't. So I'm gonna throw this out to the audience, but what kind of businesses do you guys wanna know would be good to be funded or not? So I'm gonna have you guys tell me about a business idea, and then you tell me if you think it's good for crowdfunding or not. All right, let's have them raise their hands so I can give them the microphone. Okay, so pitch me some ideas. Uh, it can be uh, either one. We're going to find out bad ones. We can learn a lot from a bad idea, too. No, no, I'd say joke with it, yeah. A strip club and a funeral home in one. 
<laughs> what do you think? Uh, I think it would money? be, yeah, absolutely. Strips? <laughs> Wait, it you works. say yes to a strip club in oh, a funeral yeah. home? All right. That's definitely not, I guess that isn't good for traditional Listen, planning. Don't let me tell us at the bank. That's right. not going to work. Uh, they, this guy wrote a recipe for potato salad. You guys hear the potato salad? raised $50,000. What, what did he want? Did he want to sell a book with it? No, he just he just was trying to sort of um, make a mockery of it. I mean, which he did, and he said, "I need ten dollars for the ingredients for to put together a potato salad." And it went all the way up to and fifty. And it grand? went up to fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> People, he okay, so written up all over the place. He that's got all this obviously a good idea. All right, let's go. Let's try a couple more of them. What else you got? Let's see what kind of creative entrepreneurs we have in this audience. And then we're going to have you look at this football example afterwards. Okay. Oh, it's going to be a music related thing. Um, I actually am a writer and an actor for a web series, and we've talked about crowd ser uh, crowdfunding, just the, the getting the cost for like locations and stuff to have it done for production work. What so, not really a business, but uh, like, a, like a web series, kind of like sure. what, how Workaholics started and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, those are the kind of things that, you know, people like to be involved in things that will eventually help them. So if you're going to teach people something and there's a target audience, is there a larger audience? I mean, it's comedy based. But yeah. yeah. So, you know, I mean, it's, it really doesn't, there isn't, there are certain topics that are funded more than others. For example, people think it's all about technology, the Pebble Watch, the Coolest Cooler. I don't right, know if you guys have heard of these like. things. Yeah. But actually... Music, and gaming, and fashion are funded more on Kickstarter on the list before technology. Can you tell us the breakdown of what verticals get what amount of money? Like so it's gaming, fashion, I, not necessarily. It's music, gaming, fashion, uh, technology, um, uh, pub publishing is a big one. People self-publish their books. There's actually a whole oh, platform yeah, Joe, Joe, yeah, yeah, yeah. for just publishing, self-publishing a book. Um, Food. There's a whole platform for food products. So if you made your own Tabasco sauce or hot sauce or, you know, whatever barbecue sauce, whiskey, whiskey, oh, yeah. right? <laughs> um, right, JoJo's. Yeah, and then of course you have uh, scientific platforms. We actually have um, a platform. Johnson and Johnson has a uh, a platform called You You uh, Caring, and it's a health-related causes for like. Uh -huh. Uh, research, scientific research. So pe people can put up a study, like I want to know how many people would react to me like doing something to them. They can say like, hey, give me money to fund this study. Oh, Is absolutely. Like oh, oh yeah, cool. yeah. No, we're, yeah, we're working really cool. with colleges and universities. We're actually working with UNLV in a big way, their tech transfer office. You know, there, there's tons and tons of innovation that never gets funded. Hey, and the hey. kids leave, they never get a cut of it. You know, they're actually supposed to, they own a piece of their, the stuff they create when they're in college. And if they can, if the tech transfer office can get it funded, they own a piece of it. Right, the, which is a great which is a great opportunity, yeah. especially if it's patent or something. Okay, so you know? let's uh, let's move on to this example. So this was a guy who was in Vegas. He used to own the um, Arena Football League here, and now has crowd. He's now crowdfunding a new um, IFL sports franchise in Utah. So walk me through what you would be asking him. Obviously, we're not going to know his answers, but walk me through the thought process of what you would say if you were consulting with a sure. company. So, so the first thing you have to do is understand you don't set it and forget it. You have to come with the crowd. And you have to spend months and months and months and months building an audience who is going to be excited about the launch of this campaign. Right. Oh, yeah. So, so to give you some background, this, this is a, a football team that's supposed to be owned by the crowd. They're supposed to be able to pick the plays. They're supposed to be able to choose the name and pick the players and do all that stuff. But it'll really compete in this arena football league. Right. So, okay. But, so but you would ask him But just to put this into perspective. Kickstarter has done $2 billion. Sounds like an enormous amount of money. But only 154 out of 100,000 campaigns have done more than a million dollars. And the majority of those wow. campaigns have done less than five to $10,000. And 54% of those campaigns fail to raise a single dollar. Wow. So it really requires. Don't, yeah, don't raise get anything. Off the ground? And Indiegogo and the other 1,000 platforms that do what's crowdfunding where it's not an all or nothing process, um, the failure rate is, is almost 90%. So it, it is a very difficult thing to raise a lot of money crowdfunding. And the reason is because people don't plan uh, well, long, you know, okay. early enough. So some of the questions might be like, how long in advance did you prepare this? Do they have all the social platforms set up? How much, how much of an audience do they have? 
How big is their Twitter followers, Facebook, LinkedIn? Okay. Do they have a blog? And you've actually developed software that helps you with this. We process, do. We right? have a, pr okay. a product called crowdfundingcrm.com, which is takes them through this whole process. You know, okay. you have to be a thought leader. Let me tell you the first trick about crowdfunding. Google yourself. If there's nothing there, you're not going to get funded. I mean, what seriously. This, what about this strip club at a funeral home? Yeah. Like, how does he even know if there's a good market for that? I mean, you know, obviously there's an audience for funeral homes. There's going to be, you know, 340 million Americans that are going to need to go there someday. Right, and there's obviously an audience for strip clubs. And there's audience, right, exactly. Right, there's 350 million right, right. men that will visit every year. <laughs> Not a fact, but just an assumption. <laughs> <laughs> right, so you combine the two, it could be double the money. Exactly. Or it could be <laughs> none of the money. We'll see. Okay, so um, yeah, so very last question is, uh, tell me about this conference that you're throwing. I think people might be interested in attending and learning more. So uh, in 2012, I put on a small, what I thought was going to be a little boot camp. And it turned out to, to be the original crowdfunding convention anywhere in the world. And we decided to go into the convention business. Why not? We're in Vegas. And it's the capital. Of, we have 22,000 conventions here. Right. So we're now going into our fifth year. We've had a, we're the largest crowdfunding convention in the world. Planet yeah, Hollywood. Yeah, congratulations. That's awesome. Planet um, Hollywood, yeah. 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 October 15th, 16th, and 17th, we're going to have over 1,000 people. People have come from 20 countries. We cover reward donation equity. We're going to have some of the world's leading experts and some of the people who've raised a lot of money. I'm going to give you an example of two people that are coming. Uh, Elio Motors, they've crowdfunded. Uh, they $17 million, wow. but they got $40 million in non-binding commitments on a process called testing the waters. And uh, the boba jacket, I don't know if you guys have heard of this, it's like a Swiss Army knife sweatshirt. And it has a pocket where you can charge your phone, and it's got a whole thing where you can sleep on the plane, you blow uh, up the hood, and it turns into a big cushion. Very Navy SEAL. It's a very, yeah, yeah. and it's, it's 15 got different... Got a pocket for everything, you know, whatever right. you need. So this guy went on... Uh, Kickstarter to raise um, fifty thousand dollars. He raised nine million one hundred thousand dollars in thirty wow. days. Wow! There you go. So he, he's coming. Uh, the fourth largest campaign on Kickstarter. He's coming to speak, and uh, and just a whole bunch of other. We have this largest expo. We're going to have room. If you know any startups that want to have a little mini booth and crowdfund live, they have to have a live campaign on a crowdfunding website to be able to do this. We're, we have some opportunities for some startups, so get in touch. Okay, with so I think everybody's inspired. Why don't we give that ticket out? Okay. What question do you want to check? Let's okay. see if the audience knows. Okay. How many... You're paying attention to your statistics. Right. <laughs> of all of the $2 billion on Kickstarter, how many of the campaigns and raise raise more? your hand. Don't yell this one out. Right, don't yell yeah. it out. Raise more than a $1 million. Oh, oh, uh, he was the quickest. Right. Yeah, he was first. Yeah. No. Uh, no, no. Oh, you, you <laughs> took a random guess? You raised your hand? <laughs> okay, I think I saw him next. And then, then you, then you. Yeah. Who? Uh, the singer, the musician tonight. Josh. Josh. Wasn't it something like 154 of them? Bingo, you Oh, yeah, great ticket. Good job. All right, well, we should have that ticket. Thank you so much for coming out. I think Thank everybody's you. adequately inspired and ready to start their own crowdfunding campaign. So, to potato salad. Yeah, to potato salad. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Give it up for Ruth Hedges. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Cheers. Ladies and gentlemen, Joshua Greenway.
hundred mistakes were one more than one love could take. If you left me standing in place, would anything come and tear me away? Ladies and gentlemen, once again, let's give it up for Joshua Greenway. Joshua, where can we connect with you? Where can we find more of your music? Uh, uh, you can find me uh, online, joshuagreenwaymusic.com. Sorry, joshgreenwaymusic.com. I'm also all over Facebook and Twitter. Um, and I'm in a band called Demi V. We're actually recording a single next Saturday, and then another one the one after that. So uh, Demi V, D-E-M-I-V-I-E. That's uh, probably the thing to find me at lately. Great. Ladies and gentlemen, that's our show. I'd like to thank all of our guests this evening, Bill Reed, Ruth Hedges, and Josh Greenway. I'd like to thank our live studio audience, all of our podcasts, and all you podcasts at home. Remember, you're all welcome to be a part of our live studio audience every Thursday night, 9 p.m., right here at the Inspire Theater, party with us on the rooftop for the after party. Join me for the after after party at the downtown cocktail room. Don't forget to subscribe to us on YouTube. Like us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, at Downtown Podcast. Thank you. Salamat. Salamat. Peace. Love. Be kind to one another.